You talk about perfection, we go a little bit step past that. They're meticulous and dedicated to their craft, restoring treasures and preserving the past. Largest, fastest, most comfortable plane in history. One legendary airliner just ceased production for good, but the history of Boeing's 747 will live on. It really showcases the city, and that's really exactly what we wanted to do with this space. We'll look inside this gleaming structure of steel and glass that's more than doubled the city's convention space. These stories and more next on City Street. Hello, I'm Mona Lee Locke. Welcome to City Stream from the Seattle Convention Center. Rising 14 stories above downtown, this is billed as North America's first vertical convention center. Its striking design of steel, glass, and wood is eye-catching, but the amenities inside are what's most impressive. Here are a few numbers that highlight this new $2 billion facility. It has more than 570,000 square feet of event space, more than doubling the capacity of the convention center when you factor in the original building. There's a 58,000 square foot ballroom, 62 meeting rooms, and two gigantic exhibit halls. One you can even drive a tractor trailer down to. We'll have much more on this new addition to the convention center just ahead. We begin with another storied building in Seattle that honors aviation, the Museum of Flight. It holds one of the largest air and space collections in the country. Many of the rare aircraft take months and in some cases years to restore. Producer Mark Fajo spoke to some of the unsung heroes who dedicate a significant portion of their lives to preserve living history. You have to, first of all, understand that you know nothing. You have to know how to do everything, and you also have to learn to embrace that you can't do everything. It really takes a huge attention to detail. You can't interpret it how you want. It needs to be how it actually is. I follow the Museum of Flight, and uh, we have a job listing. And I looked at that, and it was like the universe talked to me for a second. Every day I come to work, it still, it blows me away what legends I work among. You really can't necessarily put a time frame on some of the restoration. Something simple that may have taken a factory a week to do, now may take a year or three years to do. You talk about perfection, we go a little bit step past that. 1966. So I'd watch planes fly over all the time, but they were off at a distance. One day, while I was out in the front yard, Grumman Bearcat came over the top of our house, 300 feet, just scared the bejesus out of me. Ran in the house, but I didn't get through the door before I turned around to see where it went. That's where it started. It was just in my blood at that point, and I couldn't shake it. The other end of the building, we have a de Havilland Comet. It's been under restoration going on almost 20 years now. Inside is beautiful. You want to talk about the passion of our volunteers, the commitment. This was by volunteers. These guys were so dedicated to basically get this derelict machine back to condition is just blows my mind. To see the job that they've done is phenomenal. That right there is proof positive. All been redone. This aircraft looks like the day it did before it's almost its first flight. We're really proud. The volunteers have really put in a lot of work to uh, get it back into this condition. And I really miss those guys. A lot of them uh, are gone now. But uh, the legacy they left behind is what you're, what you're getting a chance to look at now. And I wish you could see the pride on their face once it got to this point and we're all able to kind of step back and take a look at the work that was accomplished.
You have to be excited and you have to be willing to work extremely hard, work sometimes harder than you ever have. You have to be able to go home with a sore back and sore feet or a headache or hands, but know that what you're doing, you're sacrificing for it, but you're sacrificing for a future that you're not going to get to see. What I'm doing right now, it's gonna outlive all of us. It's that dedication that the future generations can see and learn and understand the importance of our history and what it actually was, not a fictitious illusion of it or just a picture, the actual history. The amount of passion to be dedicated to this career is about the same passion as someone who believes in superheroes. It's like going to Disneyland for your first time, but you do it five days a week, eight hours a day. If you ever get used to it, you should not be doing this career. Aviation gives people hope. And with hope, you can have a dream. And with a dream, you can do anything. I think every kid can understand the new bicycle in the window. You basically daydream about that thing. You may never get it, but that doesn't stop the passion. The pride that you get from seeing the outcome of a successful build and then to watch it go on out through the world is breathtaking. Almost undescribable. And just to be able to say, here to the next generation, the next two or three or four generations, this is what it was like. And I think we all share that same desire to leave something behind that other people cannot try to, to identify. That's what I want to do. I want to do something for future kids, what aviation has done for me. The Museum of Flight Restoration Center in Everett is currently closed to the public due to limited staffing, but that could change in the future. If you'd like more information, go to museumofflight.org and click on the Exhibits and Events tab, then look for Aircraft Restoration. Next on CityStream, a mini tour of the stunning new convention space that has the industry buzzing. CityStream returns from the Seattle Convention Center new edition, which opened just a couple of months ago. Joining me now is the president and CEO, Jeff Blosser, who is the man behind this vision. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Jeff, can you please clear up any confusion about this building? Does this one replace the existing convention center? It doesn't. It's, a, it's an additional facility for us. And the reason around that is really because we didn't have enough dates and space in the arts building. So building the summit facility really gives us the opportunity now to book things simultaneously or book things in a move in and move out scenario, which really then opens up our ability to be able to bring more people to Seattle. Can you go over the names of the buildings again? They have different names, don't they? We went from the Washington State Convention Center to the Seattle Convention Center, and we wanted to make sure that the campus had the ability for people to understand which building they needed to go to because they're not connected. So being able to do that, we use the sky bridge as the arch, if you will, for the current building, and then the hill climb as the summit for the new building. And it really allowed us then to be able to make sure that people understand, I gotta go to the summit for this meeting, or I gotta go to the arch for this convention. So it really helped us do that. Now that the convention center space has nearly doubled in Seattle, actually more than doubled, what does it mean for our city? It really means a couple different things. One is, like I said, it really helps us with the types of events that we can do now that we couldn't do before. But if events do want to get bigger or if they want to have additional space or they may want to co-locate with somebody else and then and groups will do that so that they can broaden their perspective and their attendees. We now have the capabilities with the two buildings to be able to do those for them, either get bigger or have multiple events. 
As for the convention center, tell us about the new vertical design. Well, I think uh, when you take a look at an urban setting and you want to make sure that the convention center is set in a way that allows for people to enjoy the city, enjoy all that the city has to offer, whether that's restaurants or retail or attractions like Pike Place Market, you really got to be downtown. And the only way to do that anymore is really to build it in the urban core. And for us to be able to get the space that we needed, it really had to go vertical. And they have LMN, who's our architects, did an excellent job of being able to put this in the downtown uh, core in the heart of the city and then go with the space vertically that gives us all the opportunities in the space that we need to be successful. Is there a long wait list? Uh, we, it would be nice if we had that, but uh, we do have a lot of people coming in now and, and once the building is open, you know, people want to make sure that everything is ready to go for them. So we're, we're getting a lot of interest both locally and nationally now for the avail availability of the Summit Building, but also just to come to Seattle. And that's what we really wanted to offer because we were saying no a lot with the other building because we just didn't have the space and dates. Now we can say yes. And when you can say yes, then you get people to come to town. Which is better for the city and better Absolutely. for the economy. Right. I know there are too many to list, but tell me about some of your favorite features of this convention center. Well, there's lots of them actually. Uh, I really like the entrance to the building that you see here, which really gives us the ability to have uh, the public to come into our where our retail core is going to be and then the convention center itself and so we had those opportunities there's lots of issues in here in this whole building about everything that we've done from a sustainability standpoint uh, some of the wood support that you see came from the old honda building that we that was built in 1930 so we saved the structure there and we put that in different places of the building the hill climb is going to be a spectacular location for people to plug in take a load off network whatever they would like to do the ballroom, which we'll see, is just spectacular. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that really make some sense for us in terms of what people will see in the building. Glass everywhere, every corner of this building, you can see a different location of downtown Seattle, which makes it very, very special and very, very different than most convention centers. So those kinds of things, the atriums that are here, allow you to see all the way up to the building and down to the exhibit hall, which is really something that's very special and not around any other convention center. So I think we offer those things that nobody else has and we can showcase those. That's wonderful. Well, Jeff, thank you for agreeing to help us lead a tour sure. today. So we're on our way to okay. the next spot. Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay. Also ahead, after a century of service, Boeing's famed 747 jumbo jet will no longer be produced. We'll look back as City Stream continues. We've now moved upstairs to the ballroom of the Seattle Convention Center Summit Edition. As you see, they're still putting on some of the finishing touches, but Jeff, I wanted to ask you, this is a large room. <laughs> Tell me what it can be used for. Well, we can use a lot of different things in here. So it's very flexible. And the reason it's so big is so that we have that ability to be able to put in a large plenary session for like 4,000 people or sit down dinner for 3,500, or you can break this into three different rims so that you can use it for a whole different things. It could be a, a whole different set in each of those three rims. So lots of lobby space out there to be able to function with that way. And so we wanted to make sure that the uh, meeting planner had the opportunity to do whatever they needed to do in this ballroom. And speaking of ceilings, I mean, this is a unique <laughs> one with the story behind it. Yeah, so 3,900 plus planks in the ceiling, and really they came from log booms. They're called wormwood and it really sets the tone in this space of being able to use wood, recycled wood, and then also the lighting, how the lighting system bounces off of the wood in the building with different colored uh, lights and capabilities. It's spectacular at night especially, but it's spectacular for any event. And as people may not know from behind the scenes, this is a very eco-friendly building. It is. Be LEED certified. It is. And we have lots of different options there. We have uh, solar panels on the roof. We, are, uh, we buy local with all of our food. We compost everything. We are about 78% uh, diver uh, diversion rate for our, our trash as well. So we really wanted to make sure that we had the ability to have an eco-friendly building, one that's gonna have a sustainable operation and be very Northwest. And we, I think we've been able to accomplish that. Thank you, Jeff. We're moving on to one more spot, but first we'll mark a milestone. 
Last month, a Boeing 747 cargo jet similar to this one made history. It was the final Boeing 747 off the assembly line. And even though production of the jumbo jet has ceased, the legacy of this workhorse will live on. Jenny Cunningham looks back on its 50 plus years as the queen of the skies. 1969, Pan Am introduces the incredible, the largest, fastest, most comfortable plane in history. So you think you know the 747. Perhaps you flew this giant jet to Europe or Asia. The coach lounge, if you're going where it's going, why fly any other airline? Maybe you had a martini in the groovy bar in the iconic hump. But even if you are the President of the United States and spend nearly as many nights on this 747 as you do at home, you don't know the queen of the skies like these folks. There we go. A little more that way. In 1969, they made this happen. February 8, 1969. Jack Waddell, chief test pilot, formally accepts the airplane. At Payne Field at that time, the place was covered with press. Co-pilot Brian White. So I think the three of us we all had one thought on our mind was, uh, don't do anything wrong, don't, <laughs> you know. Did you ever think in 1969 you'd be talking about that first flight <laughs> in 2019? I didn't expect to be alive in 2019, but here I am. <laughs> 50 years after test pilot Brian Weigel was one of three crew members who flew a 747 for the first time, a celebration at Seattle's Museum of Flight, starring that plane, the city of Everett, the first one ever built and starring The Incredibles. She was trying to do things that hadn't actually been done before on an airplane, the magnificence of which we'd never seen before. The Incredibles were a team of 50,000 engineers, mechanics, and pilots who built... A factory, the world's largest, takes form. So they could create the world's biggest commercial airplane inside that factory machining and manufacturing. First designed to roll out, 29 short months. Over the decades, 747 has gained the reputation as an old reliable. But the talk at this party about the birth of the jumbo jet was full of adventure and misadventure, like this incident with a test plane in Renton. Long plane, short runway, nobody hurt. And there are other stories you may not have heard. All of a sudden, the blast from the engine hit the front end of the station wagon and lifted it up about three feet. And I thought we were going to tip over. We lost all our gyro-operated functions in the cockpit. So one by one, my instruments went dead. I did some terrible thing with the arithmetic and basically the wheels locked up on landing and popped all the tires and I knew I would be fired for that. John Hope was just 26 years old when he became chief engineer of the flight simulator for the 747. As the plane took shape, he toggled between the real plane and the simulator. One day he got some figures wrong, remember this is the analog age, and popped the tires on the real plane. When he wasn't fired, he used the incident to improve the simulator. I now had personal experience. When the tires burst, what does it feel like? Everything the Incredibles did was punctuated by urgency. Boeing had borrowed lots of money from lots of banks to develop two trailblazing planes, the 747 and the Boeing SST. With a mighty roar, Concorde 001 swooped low over the city, heading for Le Bourget and the Paris Air Show. Concorde won the supersonic battle. Boeing's SST project folded, and all hopes were on the 747. T. Wilson came into the cockpit, who was our president at the time, looked at the three of us and said, Gentlemen, I just want you to know that the future of the company is in your hands. 
primarily responsible for the design of this entire panel. Pat to Roberts was the engineer on the 747's first flight across an ocean. His crew was ordered to fly to the Paris Air Show, even though the range of the plane was untested. And the engines? Soon after liftoff, all four engines went into overheat. The crew decided to head toward Paris to see if the engines would cool down once they built up some speed. So, it was interesting. <laughs> and it worked. 747 was a hit at the air show, but those Pratt & Whitney engines continued to plague the program. During the flight testing, we changed 55 engines within one year. What does that mean, changed uh, engines? Remove and replace, engine malfunctions. The Incredibles didn't give up. They got to the bottom of the engine problem and invented a fix. And that kicked off the wondrous days of affordable, spacious, delicious travel. Japan Airlines has captured the spirit of the Japanese garden aboard its new spacious 747 garden jet. Too. We have the caviar card. Caviar and pate. I remember one time having to do eggs to order for 36 people in first class. Everybody that works on it, it just falls in love with it. So I would like to honor everybody that's worked on it, and I would suggest a toast, but I don't have any beer or wine here. <laughs> As the 747 pioneers wrap up this flight down memory lane, there's a bittersweet realization. This may be one of the last gatherings of the Incredibles. In part, I am here for the people that can't be here. But all of my bosses that I work for are now deceased. And so I'm kind of here for them. But their legacy will endure because of a plane that carried space shuttles, and presidents. And most importantly, it flew millions of us to the world. We made an airplane that actually changed world commerce history. And that, that was pretty emotional. Next time you visit the Museum of Flight, spend some time with this first 747. And maybe, just maybe, you'll hear the voices of the Incredibles. I guess this sounds complacent or something, but that, that thing is just ridiculously easy to fly. It's just a pilot's dream. I enjoyed the excitement, which is a part of my heart to this very day. And an echo of that maiden flight half a century ago. Even though the Boeing 747 is no longer being made, the wide-body jets will continue to fly all over the world for many years to come. Just ahead, see how beer, bikes, and baristas are bringing new life to Pioneer Square. We'll explain as CityStream continues. transformative micro district in Pioneer Square called Railspur is working to reinvigorate the neighborhood. Three new retail concepts, including a bike club, an artisan coffee shop, and a craft beer store are the first to open, and it's hoped a collection of other businesses will follow. Producer Vincent Pierce takes a look. It's a great way to get around this town, uh, especially commuting, it'll provide you less stress. Also, at the end of your day, it is a stress reliever because you get to get out and ride your bike on your way home, um, less pollution. I think one of the hardest things as a bike commuter or a cyclist in general is when you get to wherever you're going, you are 
oftentimes wet, you are oftentimes muddy, you are oftentimes sweaty. We have a membership program here um, with locker rooms, showers, you can ride your bike in, park your bike in safe bike storage downstairs, um, take a shower, get changed, head over to the office, and it'll be here waiting for you nice and clean, tuned up when you're ready to head back home. The hope for this project is to create a place that people feel comfortable, everyone feels comfortable, that it's just an inclusive space for community gathering. All the history here, the historic buildings, the beautiful neighborhood, everyone's riding in. Either in the morning or in the evening, you can kind of watch a steady stream of cyclists go by. It's kind of, I guess, the heart of Seattle. It's a prehistoric neighborhood, and it's nice to see it kind of reviving and coming back. Our final stop on this new addition to the Seattle Convention Center is the Hill Climb Staircase. And Jeff, what an amazing view. Money shot right here, don't you think? It really showcases how this building interacts with downtown. It also, this specific location here allows for people to come out from their meeting space and network, plug in if they want to, enjoy the sun like we have today. But it really was to make sure that people could get together and have this opportunity as well as the views. I mean, you can see all the way down to the bay, you can see First Hill and Capitol Hill here. It really showcases the city and that's really exactly what we wanted to do with this space. And that's part of the reason for the name? It is, so you climb up to the summit and you get the best view in town. So we really wanted to showcase that and then we called it that as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. So you've had a lot of events here already, and you have a lot more coming through. Can you tell us about them? Sure. We had uh, Comic-Con, which is everybody's favorite, where if you get a chance to see people here in costume, and the building really did really well with them. Uh, we have Shape coming up, which is a physical education group. We have uh, a Microsoft event called Build coming up as well. We have six conventions in, in April and May. We're really excited about those opportunities to have those events here in the Summit Building. 54,000 folks coming into downtown core is exactly what we're supposed to do and to help the city. Yeah, and exactly. Your quote is saying this could be a catalyst to help reinvigorate the entire downtown core. Why is that? Well, if we can put more people on the street and we can get more people to come to downtown, they activate the shops, they activate retail, they activate the hotels, and I think it really helps with the whole safety issue as well. So we want to do our part if we can with the city to make sure that we can bring people to downtown. Jeff Blosser, President and CEO of the Seattle Convention Center, I just want to thank you for helping give this tour and for being with us today. You're welcome. Action! We put together a new episode of Art Zone with Nancy Guppy every week to tell you about the incredible art that surrounds us all the time. That's art! That's art too! Yeah. Sure. Art Zone with Nancy Guppy, Fridays at 8 on the Seattle Channel or streaming anytime online. I did ask for a butterfly, but you know, a wiener dog, close enough. That wraps up this episode of City Stream from the new edition of the Seattle Convention Center. If you'd like more information on this impressive new facility and upcoming events, check out their website, seattleconventioncenter.com. I'm Mona Lee Locke. Thank you for watching.